This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good morning, good morning. We are giving you some views of a cloudy sky in Juma Private Game Reserve, but the blue skies are coming. They are on their way. The sun is popping its head out, which is great news for me. I do like the sun very much. Good morning, my name is Lauren and I do have Davi on camera. And of course, we're on Rusty this morning, which is an interesting feeling. We always say that Rusty's a boy's car. And it isn't actually the boy's car, but mechanically it's pretty sound and when you turn her on she just wants to go literally wants to go so that's why the boys love it we're going to keep driving we've got lots of things on our to-do list this morning see she just wants to go and she's also large sometimes my legs don't quite meet the requirements to put that clutch down but that's okay it's good to feel you rusty I prefer Wendy, as you know, but she's still in hospital. So Rowan will be on the dam cam today. And Mike will be out on Pridelands. So it's going to make for such a fantastic drive. And the drive is live and interactive. So please do talk to us. That's the most important thing. Otherwise, it would just be a drive. So please do send in your comments and questions. You can use the hashtag Wilder on Twitter. Or... If you're under 18, please do email us. It's a slightly different system. We're alerted to it differently. And the email address is kidsquestions at wildair.tv. Now, if you register on the website, if you wonder how to watch the drive, go over to wildair.tv, register. And as long as you're sort of on that page, you can also watch the drive there and submit your questions on that page. Now that we've got that out the way, I'm naturally on my way to the Hyena Den. This is actually a perfect morning because it's still quite overcast for the Den to be really active. And that's what I'm waiting for. I check every morning. I want a communal Den sighting where they're all there, or at least a lot of them. And we can start to see some interactions. I've seen Ribbon, but I haven't seen Ribbon with anybody else to know exactly what's going on. And then after that, we'll scratch around Chitwa in the east. Seems to be really productive for us right now. There are always leopards on Chitwa, honestly. For, us, for the size of the property, it does remarkably well for leopards. So I'm going to keep bumbling south, get to that den. So let's take a look at the one. still on Twin Dams Road right now. I have done what I always do and I get stuck in this loop. Continuous looping. Now that the den is on Twin Dams Road, I'm always on Twin Dams Road and it's actually not a good thing. And then when you try to take a different route, you feel, oh, but I should be going my normal route. But in all honesty, Twin Dams Road is really, uh, it's a fantastic road. It's used by a lot of our characters regularly. Because once you get to the bottom of it, you actually hit Little Gauri, and it's just west of the Mulwati. So there's a lot of movement, things coming from the south and things going to the south. And it takes you directly to Gauri Dam as well. So it's always worth checking whether the hyena dane is not on it, <laughs> or it is. Anna Marie, welcome aboard. You are on board and you're ready for whatever sightings we give you this morning. That is great news. Hi, Anna Marie. Always great to have you on board. 
bumbling, bumbling in the jungle. The overcast conditions do make it quite difficult to actually see right now. The insects will not be buzzing around. The birds will just be waking up. So it is really at this point in the day in these conditions, it is really the predators that you are looking for, or elephants or antelopes. I'm gonna put my foot down a little bit. This is the sort of conditions we had the other day when we got Kalamba mobile with the little ones. Actually, it's not too hot. It's actually quite chilly. Darby's got his jacket on. Are you cold, Darby? You are. I like to breathe it a little bit. It keeps me awake, it keeps me fresh if I just feel a little bit chilly. Okay, well, you all know where I'm going, so I'm going to stick to my plan and we're going to send you guys over to Mike. Say good morning. Good morning, Lauren. Good morning, everyone. It's a fantastic day to be out in the bush. We've got the goslings, still all six of them. Fantastic news. All six managed to make it through the night on their first glorious day on this wild earth, this planet of ours. We're here at Leopard Dam, the weather is nice and cool, I don't know the temperature, maybe like 22 degrees or something, I'm wearing a fleece even, can you believe it? Hi everyone, my name's Mike Anderson, behind the camera is BK, and this is Eco Training's Pride Lands Conservancy, and yeah, we're just hoping for, for anything this morning, we don't really mind what we see, we love them all, and here, an eastern olive toad I believe, raucously croaking away to the left, some hardy dars in the distance. The red-billed oxpeckers on top of the tree. A black-backed puffback, and I'll call them. Lots of birds this morning. Oh, is that a brown-hooded kingfisher? Please tell me that is. It'll be a new one for my list. No, no, that's a... That is a firm nest frog's nest. You see that nest in the tree there? Oh, it's, it's, got, it's a bit broken now, BK, don't worry about it. We're going to do some walking around the dam just to just to see what's happening. Oh, have you got the nest there? Yeah, got it. Yeah, so that's the, the foam nest. We might try and walk over there. It's actually where we've been sitting recently, BK and I, and that nest just looks like it's quite fresh. Perhaps it was put there last night as well. Let's have a look. Oh, it does look very fresh. We might go over there and have a closer look at it in a moment, just to see if, uh, if we can see any movement of tadpoles. Because sometimes if you look at them real close, you can see the little tadpoles moving around inside them. Morning, Nathan. Thank you for your well wishes. And yes, it is great to be out. Hopefully we'll see some cool stuff to show you this morning, Nathan. How are you doing this morning? Hoping you are relaxed and content. Well, I mean, you're watching the show, so I'm assuming that you're relaxed. I wonder what we can see. The weather should be quite nice today. Cool now, but it'll get warm later. That's drizzle throughout the day so maybe we'll have some interesting goings on what would you like to see today everyone you let me know what you'd like to see think about have a little think about it and send us your comments and queries oh my goodness i know that you want us to to send us over to the next thing but we've got something really cool that's happening right next to us you're gonna have to stay with us we're forcing you to <laughs> Because we've just, because just noticed all these Matabili ants coming back from a raid. These ants have just managed to raid a, a termite mound, and they're coming back with the spoils of war. 
each, almost every single one of these is carrying at least one termite. Oh, oh some of them are alarmed. Oh, dear. They're attacking. <laughs> Watch out, Pico. You're in the firing line. Very defensive. These uh, Matibili ants have sent out a few sort of scouts on the edges there. Obviously our shadows or maybe my heavy breathing as I was crouching down alarmed them slightly, but they managed to chase us off. This is a fairly decent sized raiding party. I wonder if any of them were injured in the raid. Sometimes at the back end, you see a few of the ants looking a little bit a little bit limpy alex it is super cool i'm glad bk spotted them because they're actually headed directly to where i was sitting and i am probably the least observant guide you'll ever meet i just get distracted by so much stuff so i'm never really really paying attention to what's right around which, which i probably shouldn't say because anyone who ends up coming on a safari with me i am I'm quite, quite okay. I do see stuff sometimes. But BK has, I think, the cameraman's eye. I want, it looks like, so we walked here a little bit, so you can see these Matibili ants are a little confused as to the direction that they're supposed to be moving. I wonder if our stepping and moving around there has somehow maybe disrupted their, their, um, what do I, their pheromone trail. So they're just trying to figure out now which exactly direction they're meant to go. They'll figure it out eventually. They won't be stuck there forever. I can promise you that. That is super awesome, super cool. I'm going to leave you with that and send you to one of the other feeds. The Juma Clan, a small yet thriving group of powerful female hyenas and their cubs. Ribbon is the matriarch and has recently been seen with injuries to her body. Ribbon and Tima, look how dominant her behavior is. We think after many years of a strong leadership, she may soon be overthrown. Corky was the previous matriarch and is believed to be taken back her status. Intima was born to Ribbon in February 2017 and also enjoys a high ranking. Hart is the next rank down and in June is believed to be the lowest rank, easily recognizable by a floppy left ear. It's so nice to see June and look how just massive she is. Head over to the Wild Earth website to find out about buying non-fungible tokens of the famous Juma clan. If I could take you on safari all day and all night, I would. But unfortunately, it's not always the best time to see the animals. Now, in between safaris, you can watch the Wild Earth channel with loads of extra shows. If you have a connected television, Apple TV or Roku box, then download the Wild Earth app. And if not, then just find it on the App Store on your phone. For those of you who love to join us on safari here on Wild Earth, we have some news. This is incredibly exciting. The team have trawled through the archives and found the very best of safari live from over the years. Come and disperse it. With locations such as the Masai Mara in Kenya. You can see how close he is from where I am. Tualu in the Kalahari. It is absolutely incredible. And of course, Pinda and Gala, right here on our doorstep. Listen. We have hours of great entertainment that is now playing on our channel. Catch up with guides from the past, and of course, your favorite animal characters. It's happening. I've never seen this before. The best of Safari Live will be broadcast on Wild Earth Channel daily. So jump on board and join us down memory lane. Times for this brand new series are on our website. And the march continues inevitably forward 
these Matabili ants or black hissing ants, they found their, their pheromone trail again. Well, they sent a scout out and he's managed to figure it out. And they're moving in a column almost perfectly four ants thick. Very neat, very organized, slow, methodical movement. They don't have to be afraid of much, to be honest. That's why they can move so slowly like this, because each and every single one of these ants is equipped with a very potent sting that will cause some something as large as a human extreme excruciating pain. So you can imagine they're small predators. If they get a sting, if a bird, for example, tried to pick one of these up and managed to get stung by another one, extremely painful and uncomfortable. I'm not sure what the venom is, to be honest. I think it's neurotoxin. It causes pain, whereas a cytotoxin would, would not cause pain. It would cause cell and tissue damage. But neurotoxic venoms, they will cause you pain, discomfort, headaches, you know, that kind of thing, sweating. And I've been stung by these many times. It's just like a bee, to be honest. It's just like a bee sting, except a bit more potent. If a bee sting is, let's say, a five on the scale of things that will really hurt you. Oh, check that out. We're nowhere near those ones, and they just had a little mini freak out. I wonder if some other insect or something bothered them. You see how they all just immediately scattered and then went to investigate what it was, and then they've come back to the column again. If a bee sting is a five, I'd say these things are about a six or a seven, potentially. Let's call a bee sting a four, and these things would be a six. Oh, oh, there's a dronga that just came and landed right in front of the column. Oh, apparently the lens is a bit, a bit dirty or something. I think they said something about, please repeat that again. Did you say we must wipe the lens? Hey, everyone, how's it going? Should we wipe the lens? I'm not sure. I'm just waiting for them to... Yeah, if um, the lens is a bit dirty, sometimes I break into song randomly, especially when I'm having a good time. So most of the ants have passed. Now there's about 20 or 30 that are spread out behind BK. Yeah, but not many. You'll be fine. PJ is not happy to stand in the, in the line of fire. PJ, um, how do they communicate? Just watch out behind you there, BK. How do they communicate? They communicate probably by some small sounds, like these, these ants make a hissing sound when they're upset, um, and that is probably created through stridulation, where they rub their legs on their body, and that causes them to make this hissing sound. Um, and then often pheromones. Pheromones are small chemical signals released by mostly insects that send signals that tell them to do different things. Okay, for example, when bees sting you, when that sting gets ripped out of their body, as you know, when bees sting PJ, they, they die because the, it rips out some internal parts, structures, which, which ends end up killing them. But that releases a pheromone that causes other bees in the immediate vicinity to attack the pheromone signal. And that's, that's why sometimes bees swarm when they're threatened. So yeah, mostly chemical signals, PJ. Very effective. It's also how these ants are finding their direction. Uh, uh, one ant would have gone out, found uh, um, a termite mound, would have laid a trail on the way back with some, some of the termites to show I've found food, and there's my trail. And they'll go out. This is so awesome. We're just going to follow them and see where they go. But it could take a while. So in the meantime, we'll send you to Lauren. Mike and following those ants. You can actually track insects and smaller things. When Javi and I were in Namibia, we went to, or we did like a desert tour, and the guides there genuinely track chameleons. The way that we track cats and whatever dogs, they literally track the chameleons. They look for the tiny little tracks and they're able, of course, it's all sand, they're able to see where they go and find the chameleons. They do it for geckos and sometimes beetles. Oh, wow. 
Now that's a whole new level. The hyena Jane was not active. I'm upset. I'm not in a good mood now. <laughs> Drew McLean. I wonder, I wonder if there is another another Dane. A NATO Dane. I mean, the communal Dane will be the communal Dane, whether Ribbon is in the bad books or the good books. I just wonder if another female is Dane. I'm speculating completely. I have no evidence or proof. But just the fact that Antima and Corky both lost cubs. Corky's now came into power. It's summer. Food is plentiful. I wonder, I wonder. I am just going to keep checking as I go. I haven't checked Gwen's thing yet. We're in this sort of eastern corner. I'm just going to scratch around a little bit to see if I can see any signs of Klalamba. And then we might come back down again into Chitwa and Gwenstein naturally is right on that junction. I've checked the Philemonstein. Nothing. They're all completely overgrown. And I did check the little gallery one and something's in there. What do you see, Doggy? It's your favorite. My favorite. Do you see a battle here? far back. Okay, oh, he's got a battalier. And I mean, it would be very rude to actually be in that country and not see a battalier. Mercy cats, you're saying you're so excited to have me back. Thank you very, very much. I was supposed to be in the UK right now, but naturally things changed. So I'm very glad to be back for this extra little month with you all. It's very, very exciting for me too. Davi, did you imagine your battle here? I think it flew away. I think you imagined it. Maybe. <laughs> Davi said it flew away, but I think he imagined it. <laughs> Although, to be fair, the coffee that I make in the morning is very, very strong. It does wake people up. Once you have a sip of Lauren's coffee, wow, I learned, I learned from James Hendry, that's for sure. James would get very upset if someone made a coffee pot that was very weak. <laughs> but he accepted mine, so that's good. Strong, strong coffee in the morning. But yes, it's great to be back for this additional little stint. And and it's good to just be back with the Juma clan after all that upset. I left just as that was happening and it wasn't enough time for me to sort of analyze what was going on. We suspected Corky was up to no good. And of course, Klalamba and her cubs. I want to spend as much time with them as possible. So that's what we're gonna scratch around for now and hopefully pick up on some tracks. In 2017, it was the end of a long era where Queen Karula had reigned in Juma for 14 years. She passed on, leaving Tandi, her daughter, to assume the throne. Tandi took over her late mother's domain. She was a protective mother, once luring a baboon away from her cubs. Her young son, Tamba, continues to thrive to this day. Isn't that wonderful, everybody? Tandi and Tamba. Princess Klalamba, daughter of Queen Tandi, is now the heir to the throne. Klalamba is now having a snooze on the branch. Absolutely gorgeous. Wild Earth is launching non-fungible tokens attached to many of the individual leopards that we have grown to love on Wild Earth. If you are interested in being part of this pioneering initiative, then head over to our website to find out more. When on safari, there is nothing better than an evening spent under the stars chatting around a fire, with the sounds of the wild all around you. 
If you sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer, you can build your own memories by joining our guides for regular fireside chats. Subscription payments can be made by PayPal, credit card, and now bank transfer. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. It has been a wonderful privilege to identify one of our key characters here at Penguin Beach, Pepper, with a very, very distinct facial patterning, as the name would suggest, very peppered and speckled belly. I'm really looking forward to seeing what this penguin does over the next few days and months. Because of those unique markings, it's going to be really, really cool to watch it as it moves around the penguin colony here at Stony Point. Guys, just watch what's happening. See, watch the elephant, watch the lions. See, the first ones to run are the cubs. I'm not sure how scared you were, but I was quite nervous. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. Expect the unexpected here on Wild Earth Daily. Sorry, I was just keeping my ear to the radio there. See what's going on in the east. There's really no one driving the north right now. Since the Juma team are no longer there, no one is driving. Which is lovely for driving around, you don't bump into people, but for getting updates on what's happening in, on the property is very tricky. I literally think I'm the only vehicle driving on Juma right now. Once a day, or even twice a day, you can look around the area. I mean, there's no guaranteed Kalambas in the area, but we know where the dance site is. Did you get the location there? And, oh, hello, Kudu. And look at all those birds, Davi. He also spotted them. Look at that formation. Is that herons? Not sure. Misi Kaya active in the west. Well, that's jolly good for the west. <laughs> We're not in the West, we don't traverse the West, but I'm happy for them. <laughs> that looked like herons, but I didn't get my binos out because I've just realized I've forgotten my binos because I'm on Rusty. So maybe you can tell me if that was herons or not, but what a beautiful formation. Now the West is your Simbambili elephant plains, and I imagine that'll be the elephant plains clan that they have a wonderful active Nisi Kaya. <laughs> Hello, girls. Can you work with this job? <laughs> and you look beautiful this morning. They're a little unsure of us, that's for sure. I got asked a really interesting question yesterday about an Inyala. Obviously, we're looking at a kudu, but Inyala's defense against predators, and it's fascinating because really, they don't have much defense. If you think of a female kudu here, they don't have horns, although the males don't really use the horns against predators, but they don't have horns, and all they really have is their voice and their size. Uh, yes, it's so beautiful. They don't have much that they can defend themselves against, at least a pride of lions. So you've got to think, what can they do? And it was just an interesting discussion to think, well, depending on the predator, they're either going to have to run, they're going to have to stand their ground and be as loud as they can to attract as much attention to the predator as they can and just be alert at all times. That's the only option these antelopes out here really have. 
never let your guard down. And if you see the size of the kudu's ears in comparison to their face, I mean, it is almost the size of their entire sort of snout area. Listening to everything. Fine-tuning what sounds are important, especially in summer and what are not. My voice is not important. The woodland kingfisher is not important. So you've got to sort of get weed your mind through all those sounds and fine-tune and pick out the sounds that are important. Branches breaking behind you. And Pala's alarm calling in the distance. Lions roaring, leopards sawing. These sounds are important. Dogs. That's a lovely, lovely tree you've got framed up there, Tommy. Would you like me to move? No. <laughs> Billy, unfortunately, I don't have any of my books with me on Rusty. And that question is really, really difficult without visuals. But they really don't look similar. Females, maybe. Males, not at all. So... <laughs> kudus are much larger. And I think if you got muddled up between a male kudu and a male and yala, well, you're in trouble. I think I can go forward, Darby. Yeah. Kudus have very, very short hair. They're pale in color. They're massive. They're the biggest ones we get out here, and their horns are huge. And yalas are not quite big, not quite as big, very dark in color, and have really long, shaggy coats. The females, I guess, could look quite similar. <laughs> Why is Rusty not also starting? Maybe we can give you a view of the kudu from here. But again, it's all to do with size. Coloration's different. They do have the disruptive markings going down the size, but I think that question is a lot better when you have visuals. So maybe this afternoon when I have my book, we can go into the visuals of that. We're going to keep bumbling the east and let's go see what Mike has found around the dam. This little patch of bubbly white fluid is a protective layer around a small creature called a spittle bug sometimes also known as a frog hopper um, and this is this is this little layer here is protecting it from drying out but also things that are white in the bush are generally considered to be not that uh, tasty some somehow animals don't really see it as a food source and so it also helps them to be not predated upon but that little spittle bug that's ensconced 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 i never know the word that is hidden within this little patch of bubbles is busy tapping into one of the veins in that grass and sucking out the sap and they do so at such a rate oftentimes that they end up dripping excess fluid from their body and this fluid is often a very sugary and quite sticky and that gives them also the name uh, well, the trees and plants that they feed on, they become known as rain trees because when there are many spittle bugs, I can see one, two, three in this small area here, but there's probably a lot more. The area beneath the tree becomes wet, so it looks like it's raining underneath the tree. They often get called rain trees. And oh, it's very interesting to to think that these things suck up fluid so fast that they actually have to have to excrete it at such a high pace. I wonder what the 
what the benefit is of excreting that. Well, I know, actually, now that I think about it, I can think of the benefits. First of all, they're able to produce this foamy secretion around their body, which protects them. And secondly, when they secrete and drip down the sugary sap, it does actually attract a lot of things like ants. And when those ants swarm around these spittle bugs, eating the sap, or eating the like the excretion, that, where they call that often honeydew, when they're they're feeding on this honeydew, they have then uh, a reason to protect this the spittle bug because it's a source of food. So anything else that tries to eat the spittle bug might get chased off by the ants. So it's a bit of a, a mutually, a mutually, um, mutual symbiotic relationship. Mutually symbiotic relationship. I can't speak English today. I don't know why. I don't know why. Gary, you're totally right. In fact, everything, every species is unique. Every species has something which makes it completely, well, not completely different, but makes it different to another. A slightly different color or variation in shape or size or a different food source. It is amazing what you can find. And we only see three or four here right now, but oftentimes, you'll find hundreds of them in a small patch. I wonder if that's because maybe they, their eggs are laid somewhere and when they hatch, they come out and they feed like this. I'm not even sure if this is the nymph stage or if this is a full adult. It's difficult to tell. Once you get to the undergrowth, you start seeing a lot of little creatures. There was just a small cricket, which looked like a scorpion, but I, I tried to get closer to it and it flew off. So, for now, got this little bug. What a beautiful sight. Are you struggling to decide which animal collection to buy a token from in the Wild Earth NFT pre-sale? Well, don't worry. We are now offering four special bundles allowing you to have a range of your favorite characters at a discounted price. The Genesis Collections Bundle is a box set with one of every single animal collection included. 25 NFTs for the price of 20. The perfect New Year's Prezi for a loved one. Also on special are Hyena, Leopard and Lion bundles which include a token from each collection of that species. Osana, our very favorite male leopard. Well, maybe not our very favorite. Tingana comes very close, but he's certainly one of our favorite. Head over to our website to find out more, but hurry as these pre-sale offers end on the 7th of January, 2022. As a naturalist, it's really important that I stay up to date and up to breast with what's happening in the wild and in the world around us. The Wild Earth app helps us do that and helps us stay abreast with the live interactions of animals every day. We're going to be here at Stony Point bringing you the African penguin story and we'd love to see you on the app. See you on the beach. Guys, have a look at what we've got. This is better than my birthday. Look at that. This is the first time that I ever see cubs this small. Th this is so special. This has officially just become my best sighting of all times. Tune into Wild Earth every single day. It's in your nature. Has flown off. Or 
just looking at a cuckoo. I don't know if it's the Levelon, so the Jacobin, but it has just flown off. Cuckoos are difficult to get on camera. I don't know why. They're flighty. It landed sound. I can see it, I can see it. Maybe you'll get it, Darby. Just didn't, you know, off again. I got him. Even I can see him now. Well done. get that AFC, I'm afraid. You see it, Dov? Yeah, I can see it too. It's a beautiful, beautiful cuckoo. Yeah, off he goes. Just will not oblige with the camera at all. I think we've got his... <laughs> okay, we've got... I still can't identify. It's a black one with white, but between the Jacobin and the label launch, you've really got to get a sort of close-up. Naturally, I forgot my vinyls, which is so, so bad. And Okay, let's see if we can go forward. I highly doubt this, but we shall try. Wowza, it didn't fly away. Can you honestly believe it? And it's nice to spend time with cuckoos because they're of course oh, vibrant. Yeah. Now if we can get a view at the front, we'll get a good idea. Both or can we see that tail? Yes, we can. I think it's a Jacobin actually. Has he completely flown off? I'm afraid so. Okay, if he has, then I can play the call. This is the call of the Jacobin. That's the Jacobin cuckoo. I think that's what it was. And cuckoos are migrants, so... I mean, once winter rolls around again, or even autumn, they're gone. So it's nice to just try and put them on camera when you can. Oh, well done, Darby. That's what he did again. Is that it? And the cluster leaf. I think so. Well done. Both the Jacobin and the Levelons. I don't know why I say it like that. I've got that sort of crest of hair on the crown of the head. They're both black. They both have similar white markings. It isn't and really until you see the front that you can tell the difference. The Levelance is really striped. It's got a stripey chest. You can't miss it. Whereas the Jacobin does not. The tail is also different. The tail on a Jacobin just has white at the bottom of the tail feathers, whereas the Levelance has white going all the way down. So those are the features that you've got to be quick enough to sort of pick out when you're trying to identify between those two species. But they're very similar. I think my favorite is the Dieterix. We have some female Inyala for you. We were just talking about Inyala. We were looking at female Kudu, and now we're about to look at female Inyala. And you'll see they are quite different once you get used to looking at them. Stripey body, yes, but much smaller. Don't have that Kudu hump, I like to call it. Kudus have a hump on their sort of back of their neck, and they're very... Rufus in colour, very ginger in colour, whereas kudus are much, much paler, almost like a pale, I don't know, pale grey almost, the kudus. But the size difference is quite remarkable. And you can see they've got really big ears also, but not as big as the kudus. The kudu ears really stand out. Work harder, work harder, work harder. I 
Okay, I've got it now. Leopard lover, you're all about the jokes this morning. FC told me, but they didn't tell me the punchline, so I didn't understand. But I can see now. I've got a joke for you all on this fine Saturday morning, in case any of you are suffering. Why don't kudus get married? Because they can't elope. Bobby, rate that joke one out of five. <laughs> he chuckled, leopard lover, he chuckled. But thank you for that. <laughs> I don't understand what FC was saying because I just heard them say, why can't kudos get married? I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I have not had enough coffee. But I actually have had a lot of coffee. <laughs> Two out of five, leopard lover. Two out of five. Work harder, work harder. Some people think the Cape Turtle Dove is saying drink lager. Some people think the saying work harder. I often think tingana, tingana, tingana. But anyway, on that note, we are going to try and focus on looking for Klalamba tracks. And we're going to send you guys over to Mike. Righty, so we've come over to this uh, the, the southern foam nest frog's nest, the grey tree frog's nest, and there are two here. One of them is very fresh, this one. One of them is less fresh, this one. Okay, and I'll show you how I know that one of them is fresher, because when I shake this, um, this tree branch just a little bit, you can see how the one um, foam nest is very wobbly and the one is quite firm. Now, I don't want to disturb them too much, and I've got no chemicals in my hand, and in fact, what I'll do is I'll rinse my hand in a bit of water. I just want to feel the texture. Oh, this one is very firm and quite sticky. This one just feels like bubbles. So very, very um, different in texture. So the one that's more firm has been there probably for a night or two. It's created a, a completely safe barrier for their for their eggs inside to hatch. Now they only need to be in there for three or four days before they hatch and fall into the water. So it's not a long time. And remember, I mentioned before that the the um, the color white in nature doesn't usually correspond to anything that's particularly tasty, and so. Uh, animals don't really seem to attack these things, even though inside there they would find hundreds of uh, delicious tadpoles. Um, I have seen Egyptian geese ripping these open and eating them, but I suspect that the tadpoles at that moment were actually dropping into the water, and so the geese had seen the tadpoles. Henry, as far as I know, it is not toxic to predators at all. It is completely harmless. It's a whole bunch of uh, sperm and eggs and other proteinous, gelatinous substances that the females and males have both um, secreted. And, well, to be honest, it's the female that does most of the work. The males crowd over her and try to mate with her, and she releases her eggs and also this fluid that she then works into a lather with her back legs. And that, that lather is what creates the foam and firms up and becomes the safe environment. Did you hear something, BK? Oh, okay. I thought I heard something, but maybe it was nothing. So with the cooler temperature last night and the little bit of drizzle that we were having during the night and early this morning, it shows that these, these foamless frogs have been quite active. I did hear something. It's a baboon making noise to the right. I was out of the dam. I wonder if they're coming down to have a drink. We know there was a lioness in the area, but it doesn't seem like they've seen something dangerous because they're not really alarming like crazy. They're just sort of a little bit barking. Oh my goodness, there's an elephant. <laughs> We literally did not hear them at all coming towards us. Luckily, we're close to the car. You can see the vehicle that we usually use right over there. And this is one elephant with a short tusk. Hey, elephant. Just making sure that he can see us. 
three elephants. They look quite calm and relaxed though, which is quite nice. This is why it's important that we have the vehicle close to us while we don't have a backup. You can you can look at the elephants there, BK. We definitely not ramping right now because we've got these cool elephants right over here. And we're not gonna go to the Lauren the Bumble. We're gonna stick with these amazing elephant bulls, which are right next to us. It's the reason why it's really important that we have the vehicle close to us. Um the vehicle close to us because we don't have a backup at the moment and if we were far from the vehicle and these elephant bulls had approached us we would not know with the backup with us he would be able to tell us well in advance hey there's elephants there and we would make a plan so that's super super cool very nice relaxed young elephant bulls just walking past they're gonna go and have a drink at the edge of the water bk are you happy to to keep holding the camera yeah So that was an amazing surprise. We're going to walk ourselves a little bit towards the edge of the water so we can actually see these elephants as they drink. Um, but it's such a wonderful feeling to know that these, these animals... <laughs> yeah, I told you, I thought I heard something. Okay, let's just move down here because there's one elephant that's just drinking over here. Oh, he's missed that. We are literally standing... <laughs> 20 meters away, maybe less than 20 meters from this elephant. And he knows that we're here. He can hear us. But the elephants on Pride Lands, because of the eco-training camp and because of our students that do walks every single day, we see elephants regularly. And so they've become quite accustomed to us. I'm just going to sit and watch. We don't make threatening sounds or gestures or too much movement. They should remain fairly calm. And should they exhibit some sign of not being happy with our presence, all we do is we gently and slowly and calmly make our way back towards the vehicle. And that should show him that we mean no harm and we just want to move out the way. to drink right here, BK. Mm -hmm. Me too, yeah. Hey, that's amazing. the sound of their movement they've got you know a reasonably slender body for their size so they can move through the trees and bushes but still the fact that those three elephant bulls each of them is probably weighing at least three tons so nine thousand kilograms of animal was walking towards us and we literally heard them only when they were about i don't know ten no, maybe 30 meters away. Especially now when the bush is so thick, we really do need to be very, very aware of what's around us. That's why we're not walking. At the moment. Well, we, we're walking, but only short, small distances. Hey, elephant. He's now, he's now sort of turned around, seen us. I think he'd forgotten <laughs> that we were there. He just turned and was like, hey, these people. But now he's just calmly making his way around to the other side. This one looks like it might actually walk into the water and have a swim. There's a second one coming off just to the right of him. I'm so happy right now. Literally could not be a better morning out in the bush. Possible. And it 
look at that one there. To the right is feeding on that soft green vegetation that's around the water holes. It's the most nutritious vegetation that they could possibly get right now. This grass is sucking up that nutrients. Oh, Janet, happy birthday. I'm so glad that you got to see elephants on your birthday. That's so cool. Janet, these are just for you. A little birthday surprise. The elephant on the left there, BK, if you can see its trunk, it is, it's short, eh? Do you see it? The one on the left's got a short trunk. Now, not that much shorter, maybe about one foot shorter, or let's say one foot, like 30 centimeters, 40 centimeters shorter than, um, than the others. And I suspect that either at a young age it was attacked by something, could be a crocodile, could be a lion, or sometimes, unfortunately, human wildlife conflict means that elephants like this, this elephant might be, I don't know, 20 years old, maybe a little bit more than 20. It's possible that at some point it got into human conflict. It got caught in a snare, which is a real shame. It seems to have figured out a way around it though. Sounds like we've got another vehicle approaching. That's okay, we're close to our car. We'll see if the elephants react to the vehicle that is approaching. Hopefully not. Hopefully it stays calm, but I know what they're like sometimes. Especially at, at water, if a vehicle approaches from behind, they can get a little bit uncomfortable. This one seems to have had enough of drinking. Making its way out. So this one hasn't even gotten into the water yet, really. like magic the elephants disappear into the vegetation beautiful little prince hosanna was born in february 2016 to karula the queen of juma over the years, this remarkable young male cat has captured the hearts of Wild Earth viewers around the world. He's just got the best facial expressions. We met him the day he was born. Look at the little guy! We just came around the corner. Enjoyed his playful antics and watched his first hunt. This is incredible. That's probably his first solo kill. When his mother disappeared and was presumed dead, he was left alone at only one year of age. Remarkably, he survived against the odds to become an incredible male leopard. If you want to celebrate this cat whilst being involved in a pioneering initiative for conservation, head over to our website and buy a Hosanna token. The peaceful surroundings, the nature, it's not something I can get in my homeland. So it's wonderful to be able to be live, you know, with, with you guys and feel like you're actually there. If you want to go on safari with a Wild Earth Guide, whilst honing your bush knowledge and of course featuring in one of our shows, then head over to our website. With wild dogs, wonderful, absolutely wonderful. We don't always get to see those, so that's, that's just been amazing. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and you could be making your first ever on-screen appearance. I wanted to be part of the support of Wild Earth. It brings so much um, to everybody and everything. It's brought so much to me, especially, you know, it got me through some difficult times myself. I found Wild Earth shortly before I was going to go through some things in my, my own personal life, and it's what got me through, and I know that's a story for many, many, many people, so it's important to me to provide support to that. This warthog is in big trouble. He's got elephants all around. What are you gonna do there, big guy? What are you gonna do? Oh, he's pretty brave though. Oh man, he's not even moving. Look, that elephant is trying his best, but that warthog ain't budging. That's madness, that's so funny. 
And we have a winner. The Warthog wins the standoff. Expect the unexpected here on Wild Earth Daily. I've just been admiring that white back vulture in the distance. It's very far away. Look at that. And you can see the skies are extremely grey. That beautiful blue sky that I saw earlier is slowly and, well, it's slowly disappearing. We are just going to keep fumbling for now. We are on Gory Pan Road. And naturally, we believe that Kalamba's den is at Gory Pan. But she's using that entire drainage system. It's a huge drainage system. And the cubs have been found at different parts of it. Now, they're more mobile now, of course, than they used to be. They're getting older, they're getting bigger, and she's moving with them. So she's not always going to leave them at the same spot. She's not always going to take them to the exact same bit anymore. The other day, it was so fascinating watching her drop them off. It was literally like she was just drop, well, drop one off to go back and get the other. It was like she was dropping the kids off at school. It was really fascinating. And there's obviously communication there where she's saying, okay, you stay now. Just like you say to a dog, stay. <laughs> you stay now. And she went back and got the other cub. So it is this drainage system that's running right to the west of us. I have to get my bearings there. But I don't think it's necessarily at this necessary at this stage to go bashing through. I mean, we're already one car down. <laughs> But it's just worth driving this road. She won't travel with the cubs all the time. They are getting older, yes, but they're still very small. They're tiny. So, of course, she will leave them. Go out and hunt, come back, come and collect them. And it definitely is this area that she's using. But you've just got to put a little bit of working. I remember my first few days here were actually really quiet as you're working the area. Benny, you're saying you're so excited what this. Catterday, you're excited about Catterday, my goodness, that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> but yes, I shall try my very best, of course. I just want to work the area. Catterday, Catterday. Well, with Rowan on the dam cam that's not working right now, and the weather that's rolling in, one hopes a cat is just going to walk right in front of us right now. <laughs> But yes, we thought we shall try. Now, I can feel raindrops, Davi. Yeah. Am I crazy? Yeah. Yes, I am crazy, but that's raindrop. Very, very light right now, but I wonder, I wonder. There are two birds up there. I'm not going to be able to identify them <laughs> until we zoom in. Let's try. Go away, birds. There are three. Fancy that. Look at you guys. You also look cold and miserable, just like the vulture did. Great go away birds can look quite cuckooish. They look quite big from a distance. And when you zoom in and realize it's a great go away bird, I always think, ah, oh, they're bigger than I always think they will be, if that makes sense. Very cute birds. Also, will give away a predator. Not entirely reliable, but they will go away, go away when they see a predator. I'm just going to do some covering of items on the vehicle. It might be a bit noisy, but the rain is starting to pitter patter down.
Apologies about that everyone. I think us putting on the covers, we knocked something. <laughs> if you think it's very fickle and sensitive. But we are going to keep moving. I mean, the rain's not heavy, but water and technology do not mix. So on a day like this, I definitely need your questions. So keep them coming. It's not easy when you're being rained on and not finding animals. <laughs> in the name so no we don't they are only gray there are species but within the family they're quite closely linked to your mouse birds they will come in different colors but gray go away uh, are okay. gray I'm afraid Lala, they're sleeping. I don't think that's a very good place for my game chairs to be. Swick Dam. It's my least favorite dam right now. I don't know why. I 
really hoping we can transform my opinion, but we are almost there. It's on the section that we check for Tlalamba, Drakensberg, or Ipan, so you may as well go to Bufusupan. Tim, my favorite South African bird. have a bird that you only find in South Africa that would be my favorite, but maybe Southern African bird. Oh, there's so many. I don't know if I can just limit this to South Africa, but I do love all the kingfishers. Maybe not the woodlands at the moment. <laughs> I, I do love the kingfishers. They're one of my favorite families, and I do love bee eaters. Bee eaters, I just think they're great birds. I love owls. They're probably my three favorite families of birds, but they're not just limited to South Africa, of course. But it's hard to just pick one, really. It's very hard. Before soup down, what do you have for us? Not very much, I didn't think so, but luckily we have some hippos to look at. Good morning, hippos. Okay, we are just going to sit here for a moment or two anyway and just listen and hopefully Bufo's Hook damn reputation is going to change in front of my eyes. Little Prince Hosanna was born in February 2016 to Karula, the Queen of Juma. Over the years, this remarkable young male cat has captured the hearts of Wild Earth viewers around the world. He's just got the best facial expressions. We met him the day he was born. Look at the little guy, we just came around the corner. Enjoyed his playful antics and watched his first hunt. This is incredible, that's probably his first solo kill. When his mother disappeared and was presumed dead, he was left alone at only one year of age. Remarkably, he survived against the odds to become an incredible male leopard. If you want to celebrate this cat whilst being involved in a pioneering initiative for conservation, head over to our website and buy a Hosanna token. The peaceful surroundings, the nature, it's not something I can get in my homeland. So it's wonderful to be able to be live, you know, with, with you guys and feel like you're actually there. If you want to go on safari with a Wild Earth Guide, whilst honing your bush knowledge and of course featuring in one of our shows, then head over to our website. With wild dogs, wonderful, absolutely wonderful. We don't always get to see those, so that's, that's just been amazing. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and you could be making your first ever on-screen appearance. I wanted to be part of the support of Wild Earth. It brings so much um, to everybody and everything. It's brought so much to me, especially, you know, got me through some difficult times myself. I found Wild Earth shortly before I was going to go through some things in my, my own personal life, and it's what got me through, and I know that's a story for many, many, many people, so it's important to me to provide support to that. This warthog is in big trouble. He's got elephants all around. What are you gonna do there, big guy? What are you gonna do? Oh, he's pretty brave though. Oh man, he's not even moving. Look, that elephant is trying his best, but that warthog ain't budging. That's madness, that's so funny. And we have a winner. The warthog wins the standoff. Expect the unexpected here on Wild Earth, daily. I think 
can actually see where my game drive is going. I've lost it under all the... Can you see the game drive video, Darby? Ah, got it. <laughs> We've got all the rain covers. Those heavy, heavy clouds with the promise of water. Okay, I'm going to decide which way to go now. I'm really not entirely sure. And as I do that, we're going to send you guys over to Mike. Obviously, obviously the zebras decide to run away from us as we are coming live. They were right here, they were right here in this nice open patch of grassland. They've moved off now. Zebras are very shy animals. They, they very, very shy. Very alert as well, which is why many animals like impalas like to be around them. Because they're often the first ones to spot the danger before, before making a snort and a stamp and a run. Stopping and watching us at the moment, which is quite cool. Especially with the backlight surprisingly well camouflaged from a distance those stripes don't really stand out very well even amongst the green goodbye there they go sounds like lauren's getting a few raindrops we've had a few this morning coming and going there's maybe going to be a few more but i don't know yet where the weather will lead us come back zebras come back Oh, there's a cool flower. I'm going to bring it over to you because there's lots of them. And you guys might recognize it. I'm in danger. No, I'm not. It's the zebras. There was impalas over there as well. Um, and then the zebras obviously moved across, bumped into the impalas, had a little mini freakout session, and decided to run away. So I'm going to bring over this. BK is stuck on the vehicle, so I'm going to have to bring it over to him. Normally we don't pick the flowers if they're only one or two. But if there's lots, we can pick them just to show you guys. Can I come a bit closer, BK? Yep. Can I come closer? Yep. Okay. Is that okay there? Yep. All good. This beautiful purpley mauve. What color is this? Purple? I'll call it purple. Purple with yellow in the middle and a bit of green. This is the flower of a plant called poison apple which is in the Solanum family, which are the potatoes, and the nightshades as well. It's very, very toxic. Not the plant itself. I mean, it probably has a level of toxicity. But the part which is dangerous is the very tasty-looking fruit, which, when it's green and small, looks a bit like a... Have you ever seen those tomatoes with the stripes? I think they're called, like, tiger tomatoes or something like that. Um, they look a lot like that, and when they're ripe, they turn a lovely yellow shade. A little bit like, um, like a marula fruit, but they're quite toxic. If you eat them, uh, you can get, what do they say, intestinal swelling, which just sounds awful. Imagine if your intestines were swelling up. But at this apparently certain times of the year when they are edible, and I've actually tasted one before. I remember someone had a small slice and just made me like made me taste it and it, it just tasted awful quite bitter jim yeah or there's a gin I, did, I didn't quite catch the name but yeah it is an interesting name poison apple it's a very pretty flower but yeah very toxic that's where the name comes from don't eat it it's really spicy okay i'm going to move this flower back now put it put it back in the, in the felt it's such an interesting looking flower i've actually never looked at it at this close there's little hairs on it 
Split into five, which is interesting. It is a, a dicotinalidus, dicot, dicot plant, dicotinalidus. It's a very strange word. It actually just means that it's got a woody structure and its petals are in, in um, multiples of five. And this is the poison apple plant right here. Many more flower buds coming out, many more poison apple plants all over here. They tend to grow in areas that are disturbed. Disturbed areas. As well as this, ugh, this awful looking plant. I'm going to try and bring it to you. Um, it's actually an invasive, a toxic plant that nothing eats. I'm going to pull it out because it's awful. But these things, it's a bit like a stinging nettle. It's covered in hair. I mean, this is this is next to one of the main roads on the property and quite close to zebra clearing, which is also used to be farmland. I'm gonna bring it a bit closer there. So you can see this plant as well, covered in hairs. Do you see that, BK? Yep. Covered in hairs and it has these little spiky uh, seeds growing on it. And this is one of the plants that is sometimes referred to as a cockle burr, although it's not a real cockle burr, but it is an invasive plant that takes over areas. Very uncomfortable. Nothing eats the seeds, nothing eats the plant really because it's covered in these hairs. And just like a nettle, these hairs are very irritating. Every now and again, we get the students involved in bush clearing exercises and we try and pull all this invasive weedy plants out in order to allow some of the grasses to establish. And if the students are not wearing long sleeves and gloves like we tell them to, sometimes they come back with a lot of little welts on their arms and legs. And uh, it's, it's not dangerous to you, it's just uncomfortable, it's very itchy and scratchy. So I don't know exactly what the plant's called, but we know it as a cockle burr. Linda, that's a good question. The process of elimination. Many of them I have touched before uh, and then realized that I have made a huge mistake and then I know I didn't want to touch them again. Um, this is one of those plants. So the very first time I came to Pride Lands, it's growing, it was growing all around the, the eco-training camp and as well as by the, the waterhole at uh, Dorval Dam. And we knew it's invasive, so we just said, let's move it. Let's remove it. Let's do the, the right thing. So half an hour into a removal session, I started to realize I was very itchy and I realized what it was. So it's not a plant that I handle much anymore unless I've got gloves, but I was very careful when I when I grabbed this one. See the lower part of the stem doesn't have too much of that hairiness to it. So you can, I grabbed it right down at the bottom when I pulled it out. And it's important to get roots and all so it gets removed properly. Otherwise it just grows again. It's, it's, a, very, it's a very hardy plant, as I said, nothing really eats it. Okay. Put this one back. Let's see. I'll put it upside down so it doesn't grow up again too easily. What other little grassland plants do we have around here? Hmm. There's a log here, DK. I wish I could turn this log over to show you what's underneath. But it's extremely heavy. <sighs> Absolutely nothing. Another, another, oh no, there's lots. Nothing, nothing major, the stuff you've all seen before, ants and millipedes. Well, in any case, I'm going to make my way to, or well, we are going to make our way to Ndlova Dam. In the meantime, we'll send you over to one of the other feeds to see what's going on. Our first morning view of Karula, and what a treat! Karula, affectionately known as the Queen of Juma, was born in 2004 to Safari and Mufufunyani. Karula defines success as a mother and a huntress. It's just the most amazing, amazing look at this. Well known for having raised multiple litters of cubs successfully, mothering came naturally to this cat. The Queen was adored by Wild Earth viewers from all over the world, but sadly, in March 2017, she disappeared leaving behind her last two cubs, Hosanna and Shongile, to survive on their own. Her bloodline continues throughout the Sabi Sands and her memory will never be forgotten. If you want to celebrate the life of this magnificent cat, then head over to our website and find out more about buying a Karula non-fungible token.
This is that one, I don't know if you've seen, guys, guys make soap out of the leaves. Our bodies are made up of about 60% water, which means that in a very short space of time, you can dehydrate completely. A relatively efficient way of collecting water early in the morning is to take an absorbent material like a sock and to walk through the grass absorbing the condensed dewdrops on the grass. Once the material is saturated, you can then squeeze it out into a container or you can suck it out directly into your mouth. I'm just going to move forward and try and get these elephants. They're such a winner on a day like today, but they are on Torchwood. If they move west, they'll come on to Juma, but sadly, it looks like they're moving east. to get a view of them, Darby. No. Oh, that's rather unfortunate. No, I've gone into Torchwood. In winter, you'd probably get a view of them, but as you all know, it ain't winter. I'm going to put this monitor cover on again, serene starting. <laughs> it's delightful driving in the rain, everyone. Just so lovely. I'm going to have to put that rain jacket on soon. Luckily, I didn't forget that. I have everything set up on Wendy at my box, and obviously I just forgot to lift it. But I did remember my rain jacket. As I put my rain jacket on and try to stay dry, we're going to send you guys over to Mike. We've got all three of the animals that we saw before. We've got zebras, wildebeest, and impalas. I mean, this is basically the Great Migration. We might as well be in the Serengeti right now. It looks like a bachelor group of impala as well. It's only the males that we see. And the wildebeest by himself, so also a bull. Territorial, most likely. This is his area, and he's just staying with the rest of these animals for the safety that they bring. He's much larger than them, so he's less likely to be attacked. And there's the zebra as well, of course, which, as we said, like to 
like to also be with other animals. And all of these three facilitate each other. The zebras like the long grass, or they don't mind the long grass. So when they eat that, the wildebeest follows behind and eats the short grass. They're specialized for the shorter grasses. And their partners are mixed feeders. And they've got these little uh, split lips, which allow them to feed very low to the ground. Um, and so they can actually get right to the base. So they can eat leaves, grasses, whatever. It's just the one impala left on the road there. The rest have moved off to the left. We'll move forward in, a, in, a, in uno momento once we don't have visual of this guy anymore. A bit afraid to move because we might lose signal. I don't know that that could get, that could get awkward. Oh, really? Zeb Jeffrey, you've never seen zebras on Pride Lands. We don't have an extremely huge number of zebras, but we do have regular sightings, but maybe just not on the show because uh, we don't catch them at the waterholes that often for some reason. And on the bushwalks, they're quite shy. As you saw a moment ago, they ran away from us immediately. So, yeah, Jeffrey, I'm glad you're seeing some. They are around here, I promise you. We have all of the African animals that you can think of, even Clipspringer, which is quite cool. We've seen Clipspringer, we've seen... Uh, We've seen Sharps Reisbock, and we've seen a whole bunch of other small animals. Okay, I'm going to try and move us forward, BK, you want to just take a seat there? It's going to get a little bumpy, and I don't want to lose the signal, but we got to do what we got to do, right? Okay, so give me a moment, let us move forward. We're rocking handheld here, everyone, so if it gets a little bumpy, sorry about that. DK has got the steadiest arms of any human. He might as well be a surgeon. He's a surgeon with the camera. Okay, it's a road not often driven. It's the parallel road to Marshall Road, the one we were just on now. Marshall Road's a big, big, nice, long, straight highway of a road. This one is a little bit more... A little more aggressive, let's put it that way. More adventurous. How about that? That's nice way to describe it. Stop there. Don't run away, zebras. Don't run away. Don't run away. Too late. They run away. There's another one on the left here who's been left behind. Hey, buddy. What's, what's going on there? It looks like also a group of male zebras, to be honest. So all the bachelors, all the boys hanging out, you know? Sometimes that's a good thing. A little lads, lads night, lads holiday. I'm going to go into the shoot, into the driving range, not the shooting range, the driving range. You know, for golf, with some of the lads in a few days. I'm very excited about that. Talk a bit of rubbish, have a bit of fun. We don't have to be as polite. We can sort of make fun of each other. We don't have to be polite in each other's company, which is so nice. Okay, I'm going to move forward a tad bit more. Oh, Susan. Susan, that's a great question. And it's an important question to know, and we teach this to our students regularly. It is important to stay calm at all times in the bush, uh, regardless of the situation that's happening. If we're being chased or charged by an animal, uh, we just need to remember the training. Stand still, you know, stay calm. Don't run, whatever you do, I mean, absolutely stand still. If you run, I'm just gonna stop us right over here. There's a cloud, thankfully, making a bit of shade for us. If you run, and any ch creature is chasing you, whether it's a zebra or a lion or an elephant, it's, it's, it's going to be empowered to chase you further. And so you must absolutely stand still. And in some instances, it might be worth, you know, making a bit of noise, um, especially if it's really charging at you and you, you don't think that it's going to stop. You might want to shout at it because the shouting might just turn that animal and, and make it think twice. And then, you know, let's say the animal approaches you aggressively or whatever, and it stops. That is the moment that you watch it for a few seconds, anticipate what it's going to do. Then you start moving back away from it slowly, slowly, never taking your eyes off the animal, always watching the animal. What is that zebra doing? It's on its front, it's on its knees. Check that out. It's like on its knees getting right down, probably feeding on something, or maybe it's drinking. There might be a tiny water hole there. Never seen that before. Remember, always best in any situation to stay calm. If you panic, 
you can't think straight and you end up doing silly things. And of course, never go looking for trouble. Never, ever go looking for trouble in the bush. People that try and be brave in the bush are the ones that end up getting hurt. Yeah, zebras, it must be water. They must be getting down for water. I can't imagine why there'd be any other reason for them to get down onto their knees. Looking over to the, to the other group that just moved off a moment ago. There's three zebras here, I think, maybe four, and there were four that moved off before. A group of eight males. It's quite unusual, isn't it? There's a, there's a fourth one here. Maybe a fifth one, actually. I can see a fifth one. I see a tail moving, yeah. Five zebras. And some lovely male impalas right next to us, feeding completely unaware, well, not unaware, but completely unconcerned by us being here. Jack's my name? No. They don't migrate as such. They probably move in response to where the food is, but Pridelands is not so big. Pridelands is 2,000 hectares, and the reserve for the, the property next door to us that we can also traverse on is another 2,000 hectares or so. And so they, they can't really migrate on Pridelands and the surrounding area, but they can move to the Greater Kruger area. So we're, we're open fences to the Kruger National Park. So if Pridelands is having less food or water, they could move from us into the Kruger Park and looking for food and water. But to be honest, we've got the two big dams in Dover Dam and Leopard Dam, which really mean that it's more likely that animals come from the Kruger National Park to us, which is fantastic. We find we've got nice resident populations of all the animals, including elephants and buffalo. Uh, and of course, the, the territorial animals like lions and leopards are sticking around here and doing very well for themselves. I mean, even Lagatha, that single lioness who we may well have seen a few days ago, she's still looking so strong and healthy, hiding the BK. Comfortable. No, it's not so easy filming handheld from the car. Don't worry about that. We are on a roll. We've got plenty of stuff here. There's absolutely no need to go away from us. Everyone at home enjoying these views? I absolutely love, especially with this long grass now. It's amazing to look at an impala, like these impalas that are right next to us, and they're almost disappearing into this grass. This is a low-lying area, so the, the ground here is a little bit darker in color, a little bit nu more nutritious, and so there's a lot more of the nutritious grasses growing here. the grass is nutritious and growing quite long, you see those impalas putting their heads right down to the ground. Pumi, they do have a similar diet to impala zebras, that is. Zebras and impalas have a similar diet um, in that they, they're both herbivores. But the zebras are almost strictly grazers. They almost only eat grass, whereas impalas are what we call mixed feeders. So they eat both grass and leaves off the small trees and bushes, which makes them more resilient than zebras. Zebras, to be honest, they're bulk feeders. So they need to, let me move, can I move forward a bit, uh, BK? You're gonna have to brace yourself, hey? I'm gonna move forward slightly, ever so slightly. BK's just gonna get himself more comfortable. Move us forward. Zebras are bulk feeders, whereas impalas are ruminants. So you'll see zebras need to eat all the time, constantly getting food in their bellies, and their digestive process is very quick. Whereas impalas just eat whilst it's nice conditions. Once it gets hot and uncomfortable, they move into, the, into the, the bushes and then they ruminate. They just feed on the cud. They, they regurgitate and then swallow and regurgitate and swallow. This is a slower process, but it's much more efficient. They get a lot more of that that nutrients out of individual grass. I'm going to stop in this little gap here because this wildebeest is just having a good old look at us. 
Uh, you can really see how wide this wildebeest's horns are. That shows that it's a male. Males' horns go much wider than their ears. The females' horns generally don't do that. It's just moving. Let's see where it moves out. You still see it there, BK? Yep. Yeah. It's actually a very nice area. It's nice and open here, reasonably open. It's no wonder these animals are coming into this area. They could spot danger a little bit easier. And there is water here. That is what the wildebeest and them, uh, what the zebras were, were going for. Oh, the wildebeest might have a drink now. That's cool. That's nice to see. It's just checking if it's dangerous. Come on, have a drink. Don't be shy. Oh, he didn't like the taste of that water. He just literally touched his nose to it and then turned around and walked away. I guess at this time of year, the animals can afford to be quite picky about the water that they drink because there is water everywhere and the vegetation itself is bursting at the seams with moisture and goodness. So they're really not that stressed by the need for water. nice breeze coming in now and the clouds sort of coming over us looking quite quite dark we might get a little drizzle that same drizzle which is at Juma might be visiting us look at the ears of that zebra I don't know if you can see the ears there DK yep. Where they f they move independently of each other back and forth and are filled with fur. Do you see that? It's like a, one of those microphones that they use on film sets. It's a very fluffy microphone. I don't know what they call those. The boom. I think they call it a boom. The boom is like the, the long arm anyway. Um, but that fur inside the ear of that zebra helps to muffle out the sound of the wind and helps it to pick out the sharp, distinct noises of cracking branches of. Just all sorts of things. Oh, it's so nice to watch them drinking. Zebras are just so elegant. Sounds like Juma's back in the mix. Back with us. So let's send you over to Juma and see what they've gotten up to. Are you struggling to decide which animal collection to buy a token from in the Wild Earth NFT pre-sale? Well, don't worry. We are now offering four special bundles allowing you to have a range of your favorite characters at a discounted price. The Genesis Collections Bundle is a box set with one of every single animal collection included. 25 NFTs for the price of 20 the perfect New Year's Prezi for a loved one. Also on special are hyena, leopard and lion bundles, which include a token from each collection of that species. Osana, our very favorite male leopard. Well, maybe not our very favorite. Tingana comes very close. He's certainly one of our favorite. Head over to our website to find out more, but hurry as these pre-sale offers end on the 7th of January, 2022. Hello everyone, my name is JP. I'm one of your Wild Earth Eco Training Bushwalk Guides. So for many years you've been watching Wild Earth directly from your laptop or computer. However now you can watch it directly from your connected TV, your Apple TV or from your Roku box. And if you are like me, always busy, you can now download the Wild Earth app and view it directly from your mobile phone. For those of you who love to join us on safari here on Wild Earth, we have some news. This is incredibly exciting. The team have trawled through the archives and found the very best of Safari Live from over the years. Come and disperse it. With locations such as the Masai Mara in Kenya. You can see how close he is from where I am. Tualu in the Kalahari. It is absolutely incredible. And of course, Pinda and Gala, right here on our doorstep. Listen. 
we have hours of great entertainment that is now playing on our channel. Catch up with guides from the past and of course your favorite animal characters. It's happening, I've never seen this before. The best of Safari Live will be broadcast on Wild Earth Channel daily. So jump on board and join us down memory lane. Times for this brand new series are on our website. We are just admiring our rainbow. Now, if Davi can just show you behind us, something nasty is coming in from the south. Just to the side here. So we were gonna go into Chitwa, do hear talk of lions. I don't know which lions, but unfortunately, yeah, I think we should just get a little bit closer to home and hope that, well, it doesn't hit us. Quarantine's always a good place to check. So I think we are just gonna stay at that side for now. Just in case. Or we can go look for that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. I definitely would love to find a pot of gold. It might just move off to the west, but let's see. I mean, this is very confusing. Blue sky, storm. Blue sky, storm. <laughs> Look at that, the contrast. So we're not gonna drive into the storm, we're gonna drive away for it. Bev, Amazon Island. My goodness, I've not been to an Amazon Island. Do you get Amazon Island? I'm also not sure, but I was in Ecuador when I was in the Amazon. In the heart of Ecuador, actually. And it took about three days to actually get to where we were supposed to stay. We were staying at a sort of research base station, if you like. And it was part of my undergrad. It was part of my zoology degree. I think we've got a Wilbur Wahlberg's up here. Actually studied butterflies. That was my project. We all had different projects out there, and mine was butterflies. And it was all to do with their visual capacity and choice of colors. It was a really, really interesting study, but there was a, a large group of us, and we all did study different things out there. But my specific element was visual vision in butterflies. See what an optical illusion we're about to see because as Davi zooms in, you're gonna see this gorgeous Wahlberg. I think it's a male, Wahlberg's eagle, and beautiful blue skies. If you were to tune in right now, you would think we were having a glorious day and we're not. <laughs> Look a bit soggy there though, you definitely got slightly rained on. I'm pretty sure this is the Mowati pair. Javi and I saw the other pair yesterday as we were getting towed back to camp on Central. Javi saying I think we're fine. I wonder if we are too. I wonder if that storm is just moving west. I hope so. We did check the hyena den once again. But yes, sorry, the Amazon was part of my undergrad. It was part of my zoology degree. It was such a fantastic experience. It's very intense. The Amazon is, it's scary. It's really, really scary. I mean, we had local shaman looking after us who walked everywhere barefoot. And it was incredible. They couldn't speak a word of English. We couldn't speak a word of Spanish. And it was just amazing to watch these men who understand the land better than anything, better than anyone. They, they're so in tune with the land. They're so in tune with the rainforest. 
and they understand it in a completely different way from the likes of us who were there as foreigners, who were there as visitors. And it was just amazing. It was an amazing experience. And the first, when we arrived at the base camp, our, there was a family of Jaguars. A mother had just given birth. So we were obviously informed to be very careful. You do not want to come across a mother. A new mother, no, you don't. And our first sort of big lesson was you just can't go anywhere. You can't leave base camp alone. Even if you want to go for a walk or you want some personal space or you need the bathroom and you want to go in nature rather than the long drop, whatever, you just can. If you accidentally go off that beaten track, you will never, ever find your way back again. What's that Daniel Radcliffe movie in the Amazon based on a true story? I'm going to think hard of this movie. I'm having a mind blank. Um, and we'll come back to the topic of the Amazon. But for now, I believe Mr. Rowan, who's had a very easy morning, wants to say hello. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to Dam Cam. You are with me, Ron. And yeah, I mean, it has been a rather easy morning. We have been sitting here quite a while waiting for electricity to come back on. And yeah, and that, you know, I'm not out in the rain like Ron. So I've zoomed in on the Dam Cam because there's a pied kingfisher that dives into the spot every now and then. So he or she has done it twice now and I'm hoping it might come down again. It's um, just gone off to the right. So where the, that dead stump is over the water, it's actually gone out of shot. I'm waiting for it to come back. Let me zoom out just a little bit. This is actually quite fun to play with, if I have to be honest. I mean, we'd rather be out there driving around and looking for things. But this is, yeah, my first time on dam cam. I'm actually having quite a bit of fun. But I can't see any animals around the dam itself. Let's zoom out completely. Quite nice weather though. Yeah, nice and cool. I think there's a slight bit of a drizzle coming out. When I walked up here this morning, there was no rain at all. And now it seems rather misty outside. Dark man lover. Good to know. I'm also quite happy the damn cam is back. I did want to see what it looked like. So we actually got an update on Dark Mane now that Dark Mane Lover is um, asking about him. He's been around Pungwe camp for the last week or so. I spoke to Mish about it what, two days ago. Rather quiet morning. Let's check if there's anything in the clearings. There was a small herd of impala. It looks like something is moving over there. Small herd of impala here, a little bit earlier. Norman, yes. Um, Norman's asking if I would ever take a swim in that dam. And to be honest, I'll, yeah, I would. Especially on a hot, hot, hot day. So we found the impalas. Still just standing in the same spot as earlier. They moved a little bit slightly to the left. Um, yeah, Norman, on a hot day, you know, it's... And we know there are no hippos, there are no crocodiles. <sighs> the biggest thing would be other parasites, um, larger things like that. Seems like that one female on the right, I 
Africa now. She's her ears are up and she's staying in one direction. So there might just be something in the grass there grabbing the attention. But they seem fairly relaxed. Um, even from this distance, you'd be able to see if they were alarm calling at something. And with impalas, they tend to, when they see a leopard, they would alarm call and actually move closer to the leopard, literally letting the leopard know, I can see you, I can still see you, I can still see you. Which is quite odd, because if you look at the behavior of bushbuck, they would alarm call once and then run away, thereby almost giving the leopard the upper hand because they lose visual. So especially with an ambush predator, rather keep it in your sights. But it could also backfire. I mean, the closer you get, the more danger you are in. From the looks of it, yeah, it looks... Um, see, the back of the impalas are quite dark, so it almost looks like they have pilo erected, so the hairs are standing up, giving it that darker appearance. Usually when it's down, it'll be a lighter appearance. You can see the different coloration, dark to lighter to light on the belly. Yeah, and just little tails wagging every now and then. Otherwise, super relaxed. There were two males here a little bit earlier. You could see the horns. It's difficult to tell now exactly where they went. It's not quite rutting season yet, so the males do tend to get along just a little bit. And then soon when it comes into rutting season, all of them will set up small territories that they'll hold usually for about seven to eight days, uh, try mate with the females during that time. And then they'll lose their territory to a stronger male who's been eating and grooming and looking after himself. And then that male will come in and try mate with all the females. I'm gonna go a little bit down just so we can lighten up the screen a bit. Quite nice, you can see the breeze in the grass. Batty, that animal I showed you right now is both a grazer and a browser. So quite a few of the antelope species are. And, you know, it really works out very well for them. Um, because in drier seasons, when the grass is terrible, they can go towards browsing. And so get majority of their nutrition from that. Also, the elephants being a bulk feeder, I mean, I think I've spoken about this quite a bit, that sometimes the large males would eat from 200 to 300 kilograms of food a day. So that comes into play. They can, um, you know, eat grass, eat leaves, eat bark, making it a bit easier for them to find food rather than your pure grazers when they, when it gets very, very dry during winter time. You can imagine the grass isn't too nutritious or nice to eat and yet they still have to stick with it. And I often think about that. I mean, I've spoken about food on my drives, you know, having Mexican food, having Indian food. Imagine for your entire life, you have to eat grass. I mean, of course, you're not gonna know any better than that, but oh, no chili sauces, no chutney, no acha, no spices. But I guess if you're a mixed feeder, browser and a grazer, at least you get to have two types. Then again, you'll get species like Inyala that often follow monkeys and baboons around just in case they drop fruit or anything from the trees. So they get a bit more variety in their diet. Hokamore. 
is an impressive looking male leopard. Look at that neck on him. He just looks ready for a fight. This is only the third time that we are seeing him that is known as the Hukumuri male. And he certainly has a lot of character and atmosphere. This is gorgeous. Hukumuri having a drink at one of the little seasonal pans that's filled up after that beautiful rain we had last night. First time seeing Hukumuri, isn't he beautiful? He's got the babies, he's got the baby. Two of the babies made it away. He's got the one baby. Only meters away from me, folks. You know, for all we say he's a gangster and he's got a face for radio, we only tease. He's actually highly, highly adorable. Isn't he absolutely gorgeous? Compact, powerful, focused. It's not just Hukamuri, an elephant's approaching. Look, look at this. Nothing beats sitting around a campfire at night whilst on safari, listening to the calls of the wild and chatting to your guide. If you sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer, then you can enjoy this from the comfort of your home. Imagine hearing bush stories from your favorite Wild Earth guide and reliving their highs and lows of a life spent in the wild. Every month, Wild Earth Explorers will be treated to an exclusive fireside chat, special occasions, hot topics and deep dives into the Wild Earth characters. Everything else is just welling up inside of you out in nature. You know, some people think I'm weird, but I have an absolute joy. I have a good time. Now, I enjoyed myself thoroughly today. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. It has been a wonderful privilege to identify one of our key characters here at Penguin Beach, Pepper, with a very, very distinct facial patterning, as the name would suggest, very peppered and speckled belly. I'm really looking forward to seeing what this penguin does over the next few days and months. Because of those unique markings, it's going to be really, really cool to watch it as it moves around the penguin colony here. It's So Lauren was mentioning earlier that um, luckily she forgot or she remembered her rain jacket and remembered to put it in Rusty. So I forgot to take my rain jacket out of Rusty. So luckily for her, she's not got two rain jackets if it does get too cold out there. And Paolo's are starting to get more and more active. You can actually see some of the baby sails or yeah, it's quite, it's quite funny how tiny they are. You just see heads sticking out when the youngsters walk past. A little bit indecisive about the direction they want to move. The one goes to the right, then it goes back to the left, then it goes to the right again. Looks like they're further in the back is one of the males. Just a little bit obstructed by the guari bush. Basically right in the middle of the screen. Also starting to green themselves. Sorry Sam, I got your question. I didn't quite copy your question. I don't know, I've got a question coming from Sam. Uh, so Sam's asking, when is the mating season for impalas? Usually around um, April. So impalas, April, May. Impalas are pregnant for six months and it's actually a very clever strategy. They would want to give birth in the rainy season when there's enough food for the babies. And then, oh, the bush is just absolutely overwhelmed by countless impalas. And they make the cutest, cutest, cutest sound. So yeah, eustress for impala, it usually lasts about three weeks in May. 
um, time. And yeah, all the lambs should arrive within a three week period because of course yeast just only lasts for three weeks. One of my favorite things to watch about Impala is when they, um, uh, sometimes when they run away from each other or they're playing with each other or especially when they run away from wild dogs is they have almost this rocking horse gait and it, it's just absolutely incredible to watch how easily these animals move. Of course it shows their athleticism and so to show that off it's like the impala is saying no no don't come for me i'm way too fit you'll never catch me I'd rather go for my friend who's not doing this rocking horse gait as good as i can quite a substantial herd a few of them there i've not counted them yet but i probably will Oh, that's cool. There's a windshield wiper on the camera. Sorry, I'm still just playing around. Yeah, the wind is definitely picking up. Lauren was saying earlier that it looks like a storm is coming from one side. I wonder if that is from the west or the east. So. We're going to send you over to Lauren. Uh, I think she's also looking at some Impala. I have probably stolen your Impala's, Rowan. The rain got really, really heavy, so we started racing back for a rain roof, and now it's stopped. So you can see it's not looking great, but there is a rainbow in the distance and all of these impala were flat and it was so lovely, but naturally they've gotten up now. When they sit down, the lambs, the grass is taller than them. It's very, very sweet. So now we do have a sea of impala, but we have come closer to camp. I don't think we can afford to be rained out today which means that if anything does, well, if the skies open up, we can just race back. It's a little bit safer to be closer to camp, I think. I just can't believe how big the lambs are getting. We've actually got Inyala's approaching the scene. I can't see anything out of my monitor. <laughs> I'll just guess what we're looking at, but <laughs> Inyala's meet Impala. And the Gowrie Dam, or any dam really, is a perfect place to hang around. You have really delicious palatable grass because it's near a water body. You have lots of other antelopes, so it's quite safe. You have a big open area so you can see around you, even though the grass is long. It's really an ideal scenario just to hang out here, which is exactly why they do. And they will know exactly what's in store for today's weather before we will. Virginia, you've been enjoying the weather. Not sure which weather you've been enjoying, but I think we are definitely in store for rain, 100% today. We've had a lot of rain over the past few days. It normally comes in in the afternoon or at nighttime, which is naturally great. It's, summer's fantastic when it just rains through the night and you wake up and everything's damp and wet and you can smell that sort of petrichor and the sun comes up again. But naturally, when it hits during the day, it's a little bit more challenging from us, for us. But I've definitely been enjoying the sunny days. <sighs> the 
It's another male. I could see this male here getting really alert, almost as if he was about to alarm call, but it, he's looking at another male. Now there's a male in Yala. Billy, you said you were getting confused between Nyalas and Kudus. The male in Yala is here at the party. I really don't like anything like male Kudus, but the females could see why people would get confused. Dr. Rocky Balboa, absolutely. We don't really have that many wildebeest here. Not really. Nothing like the Maasai Mara. We do have a few territorial males around and we do have the sort of usual herds that hang out on quarantine. But, oh, a tenfold, you get so much more in Pala. And Pala really thrived, especially when the Sabo left this environment. And that's why you coin them the buffer species. And it just means that. <laughs> Look at that male and female and y'all are together just looking. I can't see anything at this moment, so I don't know why. <laughs> but yes, you, you sort of term them the buffer species because they are buffering and protecting other antelope species in the area because they are so common and they are so numerous. They're medium sized, they sit right in the middle. And if you think of a hierarchy of antelope that we get here from the smallest to the biggest and Palo will sit right in the middle as a buffer belt for them. And it's not intentional, they just are that way in the ecosystem. Okay, since Rowan is on the dam cam and we're very much encroaching on his territory, we're going to head up to quarantine and see what we can find. For years, the game of Leopard Thrones in Juma has been a fascinating soap opera. Tingana has been affectionately known as the Duke of Juma for many years. But his path to the throne was not an easy one. Mvula was a legend from the south who tried hard to push the king from his territory. This is the cat that I'm pretty sure Tingana was sniffing around for. That is Mvula. How exciting is this? Eventually, Mvula lost, but his young son, Quarantine, started to push through from the east. At the beginning of 2018, an intruder arrived. His name was Hukumuli. The look on his face sent chills down your spine. Wild Earth is launching non-fungible tokens attached to many of these individual animals that we have grown to love on Wild Earth. Head over to our website to find out more. What are you doing? Are you trying out for the ballet? <laughs> now it's an itchy bottom. Up we get. Mom's coming. Everybody's moving off. I love being a cam up for Wild Earth. The animals coming right up close to you, especially like lions. Sometimes you get nervous, but you have to go with the flow. <laughs> My favorite animal to film is the elephant because of how big it is. But when it's really up close to you, it's one animal that you would say, I really respect you. We are 
sitting here at the den, the Pridelands clan hyena den. No one's home at the moment, or at least no one's out and about. I know it's the first time many of you have seen this for a while, because walking here is a bit of a trick. Because right now especially it's so thick, we can't really see it from a distance, and everywhere we've tried to get a glimpse of it, it's always been poor signal. Um, and we don't want to walk to the den, because we don't want to disturb the hyenas that are here. So this is quite cool to be able to drive here and have a little look-see at it. Unfortunately inactive, but a very well used and recently used den. I'm pretty sure there were people watching some of the hyenas just yesterday. It's a bit late in the morning and a bit warm, I think, for them at the moment. But it's nice to see how extensive it is. There's at least three entrance holes this side, and I think there are more the other side. And this particular den is quite interesting because about a year ago, myself and the cameraman at the time, I think it was Seb, we actually filmed a very interesting interaction between warthogs and a hyena at this very den. There were hyenas lying around the den, and a big male warthog came and walked right up to the den almost touched noses with one of the warthogs and then basically uh, reversed itself back, um, picked up a female warthog and escorted her to the den and went into the den with the warthog, came out and fetched two more females and brought them into the den. It must have been different den sites or different um, you know, entrances, different chambers, not connected, because of course you're not going to get hyenas sleeping in the same nest, uh, entrance or the same hole as a as a warthog. But this was such an interesting thing; I've never seen it before. Subsequently, I've heard that it's actually quite quite co not common, but it happens. Have you guys ever seen that before? Two different animals using the same den simultaneously. Any of the other guides seen that maybe? Lauren, have you seen that before? Rowan? I've seen a, a hyena lying on a termite mound at the den and then a warthog coming to the den straight, straight at the same time. I thought it was pretty fantastic. But that was before the den was as well established. I'm pretty sure now with the amount of activity in hyena cubs, that are in this clan, I don't know if the hyenas would really tolerate a warthog. I really don't think that they would. Let me just quickly call on the radio. Oh, Frank, Frank, come in for Mike. I don't know if Frank has a radio, to be honest. Yeah, Clive, yeah, I mean, it is really cool to see the den. I really hoped that we would see some of the youngsters, but it is really hot. I mean, earlier on it was nice and cool, but now it's getting warmer. Uh, they're not out. But now that I know we can drive here, it's actually quite cool. We will definitely try and get here a bit more often, so long as we don't have a backup to walk with us. We are yeah, we're able to come here. It's really cool. the dove up there is it doing its its call you can really see how it stretches its neck neck out it's a cape, cape turtle dove or ring neck dove trying to get a female interested in any case we're going to link you over to lauren see what she's got for you but i'd love to find out if lauren has ever seen a warthog and a hyena using the same den Interesting, because we did actually have a live sighting. Ravi, were you not the cameraman? I think you were. Um, when the Juma clan were using the little Gary Dane, and we arrived there and we saw June. And it was great news. We were so happy to see June, and she was on her way to call out Navella to say, "Hey, darling, I'm here. Time to suckle." And just as June got to the entrance. Warthogs ran out of the den, and it was actually quite scary. Do you remember that? Yeah. We didn't expect it. We thought the hyenas were in there because they were in there yesterday. 
So I still wasn't able to figure out were they both using it or had the hyenas actually left and been moved to wherever they were being moved to. We didn't figure that out. And then the warthogs just came along and thought, oh, okay, you know, this is empty now. We're going to take up shop. Or were they both using it at the same time? I'm really not sure. I mean, warthogs and hyenas are not friends, to say the least. So I don't imagine they would both use a den at the same time. But that was a sighting that we definitely had, and we all got such a fright. I think June got the biggest fright, <laughs> expecting to see her daughter, and lo and behold, a warthog runs out. You can imagine she got a big fright. Well, I'm not even going to stop. Galago pan. Nada. Yes, I feel the same way, Adida. Hmm. Gal Galago pan was always a pan that I didn't really bother with much. And then, of course, I started having hyena pool parties there on a daily basis. And then I started to realize, actually, this pan is worth checking. But sadly, not this morning. I will also be checking the hyena den this afternoon. Gabby's happy about that. All the cameramen know that when they jump on Wendy with me, it's going to involve hyenas of some sorts. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to slow it down a little bit, try and see if any of the insects are flying and spend some time on quarantine. And we're going to send you over to Rowan, who's going nowhere on the den cam. Still on the dam cam. Um, yeah, we've got two female water bucks just standing on the other side. There was a little bit earlier, there was an elephant that came down and actually lost his temper with the water buck. But instead of approaching them, he ran away. So I think just a young elephant bull. Maybe just not too sure of himself yet. Absolutely, it always amazes me how still these animals can stand. You know, they've been literally just standing here for four or five minutes now. You just see the shake of a tail every now and then to ward off some flies, but that's it. Otherwise, just right here. Of course, given the name Waterbuck, they're always found clo quite close to water. I think usually within a radius of about five kilometers. And I can imagine there will be a territorial bull here somewhere. Just not too sure where he is. He hasn't popped out into view just yet. Nope. No sign of the male. So the one on the right is chewing. See her lips moving ever so slightly side to side, chewing a bit of cud. Quite a heavy antelope. The female's about 180 kilogram. Loratu, they are actually excellent swimmers. Um, I told this story the other day, but I'll, I'll do it again. We, uh, I watched a pack of our dogs. There was about, I think there was 18 wild dogs that were chasing waterbuck around a dam and they honed in on this one baby and it was absolutely terrific to see this baby just run 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 and the wild dogs actually started catching up to it and it just ran straight into the water jumped into the air dived into the water and just carried on swimming and straight across the dam it's a rather large dam i think side to side is probably a hundred meters or so. And then lengthwise, it's about 250 meters. So it escaped alive and well. It swam right across the dam, a hundred meters. The wild dogs just weren't fast enough to get around it. And yeah, came out the other side and ran away. But I've also just seen water bucks stand in water 
and face off wild dogs. They would just wait in water, wait for the wild dogs to move off. Because they're quite comfortable in water. Not like, I mean, I've had sightings of lions chasing a buffalo into water, and the buffalo eventually just gets so tired, head starting to drop, head starting to drop, and they come out, and the lions just lie on the edge, and they wait it out. Again, out here, everything is just a game of patience. Quite a stinky antelope, though, I must say. Um, especially the males, the territorial bulls, they give off quite a heavy aroma. I think I've heard people say you can smell it from about 500 meters away. So I haven't really tested that theory, but you can definitely, when you get close to them, just smell the glands in the skin. Very stinky. The glands, I think, is actually, it helps with the waterproofing of the coat of a water buck, especially because they are such good swimmers. They'll often take to water to avoid predation. You can see from the water, it doesn't look like there's any rain coming down. So I think Lauren is keeping quite dry. Shongile was born on the 3rd of February 2016 to Karula, the Queen of Juma. We watched her grow from birth to enforced independence when Karula disappeared. On the 19th of August 2016, we caught up with Shongile, but the afternoon did not go as well as we hoped. Tandy, Shongile's sister, was on the prowl. From nowhere she appeared, and a traumatic fight ensued. As darkness fell, Shongile escaped to a tree. Shongile is just trying to catch her breath up there. That was the last sighting of her on Juma. She disappeared into the wilderness just as her mother before her. If you want to celebrate the short life of Shongile, head over to our website to find out more. Do you dream of traveling to a far-flung wilderness location where life continues as normal? A place where you can escape to nature and breathe. If you become a Wild Earth Explorer, then this could soon become a reality. Subscribe today and stand a chance to win regular travel prizes. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. Cape Nature is the chief custodian of the Western Cape of South Africa's natural environment. This highly successful organization strives to conserve the province's natural heritage to ensure a sustainable future. Besides nurturing nature, Cape Nature offers an authentic ecotourism experience to local and international visitors. And one of these experiences is walking amongst the penguins at Stony Point, or as we know it, Penguin Beach. Wild Earth broadcasts live from here every day and is very privileged to be partnered with Cape Nature who have focused their conservation efforts here. If you want to visit these iconic black and white African penguins for yourself, then head over to our website to find out more. Cape Nature. Conserve. Explore experience. Well, we are back in camp and Marcel has just arrived looking very puzzled. Marcel is okay. We're live. We've got an animal. He thinks there's a tech problem. <laughs> We're okay. <laughs> Now, everyone, I'm back in camp because this is an animal that I can find and I am overjoyed. Are you ready to see what we have for you on the wall? Theria indica, right here. It's a juvenile, it's a small one. One of my favorites, yes. And Rowan is sitting about 10 meters away, maybe 20. So I would like FC to ask him to come out and meet me because he told me yesterday he hasn't never seen one before. 
So we're going to show Rowan what a flower mantis looks like. And I was actually jogging yesterday when I found this. And I stopped jogging. It was a great excuse to stop exercising. But this is a flower mantis. And you may not entirely know what you're looking at. And it's tricky. That's because they have one, well, you call it aggressive mimicry. It's what they're doing is, yes, they're camouflage, but they're using the camouflage to lure in prey. And that's why they're mimicking, they're mim mimicking the flower of the Waltheria indica. And they're sort of using it in a sense to pretend that they're part of the plant and then the prey come, whether it's a bee, a butterfly. I've seen a flower mantis eat a butterfly. Hi. Hi. I have something to show you. Are you ready? I'm in my damn <laughs> Shall we try and see if we can get Rowan to find it? Okay, this Waltheria indica here, it's on it. Can you see the flower mantis? You saw this when you went for a run? Yes. When it comes to my eyesight, don't ask Ooh. questions. I really don't understand it myself. <laughs> it's a lot tougher than it looks. <laughs> it's tough. Am I just looking here? Yes. Oh, wow. It's a small one, it's a juvenile, but it is on this plant, and I don't actually know how I saw it. I was running, I promise. I was trying very hard to exercise. Oh, Marcello's coming as well. Marcello. We don't have a tech problem. Get the whole team. Where's Odie? What is it? Shall I give you, let's see if Mar Marcel can spot it and then we will give Rowan a clue because I feel like the boys are not winning at this situation. You're looking for a mantis, Marcel. Uh, I'm not even going to try. <laughs> He's not going to try because Marcel only focuses on tech problems and the plant does not have a tech problem. You're close, Rowan, you're close. I mean, I'm looking at flowers now. <laughs> Oh, it just moved, it just moved. <laughs> and that's the giveaway point. When it comes to mantises, their key is staying still. Their camouflage is not going to work when they move. The minute the mantis moves, it's giving its game up. So it stays still it. like this. You got it. <laughs> Took you long enough, hey? I did. I just <laughs> can't believe you found that on a run. <laughs> And it's a small one. They do get bigger than that. I mean, this species does not get huge, but they do get much, much bigger than this. I don't know how I saw it either. I guess it's because I'm looking for them. And they are camouflage, but they also do stand out, if you think about it. They are quite white against the green of this plant. And it's aggressive mimicry. It's very aggressive. I mean, the minute a prey thinks it's a flower and goes too close, bam. Davi and I actually had a wonderful sighting of one hunting or eating or killing, whichever word you want to use, a butterfly. And it devours its prey very, very fast. They are the ultimate predator after all. Very often we get asked about predators and people think lion, leopard, hyena, dog. But really, this little guy was probably the size of my pinky nail, if not a little bit longer. Is also an incredible predator. Station. Off to the start. <laughs> <laughs> In Singer, you're late. How terrible. But there you go. Are you happy, Rowan? I'm very happy. Thank you. Okay, I think you should get back to your damn cam duties. Enjoy. <laughs> but I really love these insects. I think they're absolutely incredible. And they come in all different shapes and sizes but when it comes to the females they the males are about half the size of the females so just like spiders the females are so much larger so when you do see them next to each other and i'm starting to wonder maybe this is actually a male because I saw his exoskeleton yesterday, I saw him coming out of it. I think that's what drew my attention to it when I was running. And maybe the reason I think it's so small is because it is the male. And the minute they move, it moved earlier, it's game up. So as soon as a prey species is coming to the flower, 
or thinks it's coming to the flower, sorry, sees movement, immediately they will fly away. And that's why a lot of flies, bees, butterflies, they hover a little bit before landing on a plant because they're trying to see if they can see any danger or any threats like this one in front of us. And as soon as they sense movement, it's game over. The camouflage is great. They look like a flower, but they need to stay still. That's the whole point in being a flower mantis. That's incredible. Over the moon. Okay, I think I'm going to stay here with this guy just a little bit longer. But for now, we're going to send you over to Pratlands. Less than more, hen baby. Look at that. Back again. Second year running. Probably has been here more than that, but it's the second year that I've seen it. Such a cool little bird. Much smaller than the than the other moor hens. This is a female, more brown in color. The male is very, very dark, almost black in color. Haven't seen the male yet. It should be in there somewhere. Such a great little bird to see, though. Some of you, this is probably a new bird. Those of you who've been watching the show for a while will recognize this bird because we showed it to you last season as well, same place. Birders will, will recognize that this is, in many places, a very difficult bird to find. It's just so nice. The, the common moorhen is a bit larger, 34 centimeters or so, and the lesser moorhen only standing about 23 centimeters, so very, very much smaller. And it's an uncommon intra-African breeding migrant. And it says it only really is migrating en masse on good heavy rainfall years. And last year was an incre incredibly, incredibly heavy rainfall year. I mean, our Pride Lands camp from Eco Training was completely underwater. And this year seems to be going the same way. I don't know if we'll go underwater this year. It's definitely, it's definitely wet. All the pans are full, which is great. It's a very skulking bird. It doesn't come out when we say a bird is skulking. It means it likes to stay hidden. It doesn't like to just come out into the open freely. A very shy and retiring bird. I'm trying to double check what it actually eats. I'm sure it eats in, yeah, invertebrates. Oh, and plant matter. So you might find it plucking away at the, the seeds at the, at the edges of the grasses. They like well-vegetated wetlands of which this whole drainage line is well vegetated and it has lots of pools like this as we go. Oh, is that a kingfisher? What is that I'm sitting on there? It's a crested barbet. This moorhen seems to be disappearing now. We still got it there, BK. Okay. It's disappeared for now, but we're going to stick around here because there's actually a lot of bird activity around this little water hole. And we'll send you off to one of the other feeds in the meantime, whilst we keep watching and waiting. Are you struggling to decide which animal collection to buy a token from in the Wild Earth NFT pre-sale? Well, don't worry. We are now offering four special bundles allowing you to have a range of your favorite characters at a discounted price. The Genesis Collections Bundle is a box set with one of every single animal collection included. 25 NFTs for the price of 20. The perfect New Year's Prezi for a loved one. Also on special are Hyena, Leopard and Lion bundles which include a token from each collection of that species. Osana, our very favorite male leopard. Well, maybe not our very favorite. Tingana comes very close. But 
He's certainly one of our favorite. Head over to our website to find out more, but hurry as these pre-sale offers end on the 7th of January, 2022. If I could take you on safari all day and all night, I would. But unfortunately, it's not always the best time to see the animals. Now, in between safaris, you can watch the Wild Earth Channel with loads of extra shows. If you have a connected television, Apple TV or Roku box, then download the Wild Earth app and if not, then just find it on the App Store on your phone. Wildlife trafficking remains a growing problem in South Africa and often made worse by the way the media portray this complex issue. The Wildlife and Environment Society of South Africa, WESA, have recently embarked on a program whereby they train reporters to better tell stories of wildlife trafficking. In my community, wildlife conservation is mostly something other people do, and I would like to change that. My name is Iman Singli. I told people I met that the pangolin is one of the most trafficked animals on the planet. But what is a pangolin, they said. Why is it in danger? This is what made me decide that the pangolin story must be told. If we are to play a part in preventing the extinction of this animal, then we must all be part of the battle. A partnership between WWF South Africa and WESA, supported by USAID. found another mantis they must all be popping up now it must be the time of the flower mantises now that daniel ratcliffe movie was jungle i always forget that i always think of lost as in the series lost i don't know why but yes that movie was jungle it's a great movie and it's based on a true story where they do go off the beaten track in the amazon jungle and pff, it's a tale of survival i guess but I'm glad I remembered that I'm getting old. Back to the incredible insect that we have in front of us right now. I'll jump out in just a minute and show you exactly what they're trying to mimic. But there's an interesting sort of piece of information where research actually suggests that the females, now remember they're bigger, that the female strategy of hunting pollinating insects actually shaped the two known species in terms of evolution. And what that meant is the females are much, much bigger. And it's the females that really resemble the flowers. And that led to a split in the sexes, sorry, I said species, I meant sexes, where the males are much, much smaller. And although they do resemble the flowers, what they are specially adapted for, mm, that wind's blowing, they are adapted for hiding so the males don't really work in the same way as the females they don't sort of pose so grand and try to be the flower what they are trying to do is just blend in they are trying to hide and what happened is long ago that the ancestors I guess they began hanging around the flowers and at some point the flower mantises realize that, hey, if we actually spend a lot of time next to the flower and we don't really move, all the food is coming to us. We don't have to do anything. The flies are coming, the honeybees are coming, the butterflies are coming. Wow, this is great. We can start preying on the pollinators. And along the line of evolution, that's how the flower mantises evolved. The females took advantage of the larger pollinating insects that visited the flowers and they evolved into looking more and more like them as time went on. The bigger the female, naturally, the bigger the insects she can take down. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm sure it was a monarch we saw a flower mantis eating. And a monarch's a big butterfly. But the males remain small. So they're camouflaged, yes, but they're not exactly trying to mimic the flower. Anna Marie, you're saying, yay, you've been waiting to see one of these pretty guys. 
I, me too. Every time I look, I look and I look in this particular plant because that's where you find them because they are quite specific to the plant because they're trying to mimic the flower. I'm just going to jump out and quickly show you exactly what I guess they're trying to mimic. So the females are very grand, they want to be seen because they want to be seen as a flower, but the males are high down. They're trying to just stay camouflage on the plant, but not draw too much attention to themselves, avoid predators. And then of course, well, you've got to get a mate. So Mantis is on this one. So I think maybe this is quite a, a good, are you able to get this from here, Dovi? So you can see the flower here that's opened, that's opened right out. It's pink and it's got lots of grand colors. They're not entirely trying to mimic that part. If you look at this leaf, you'll see the flower Mantis's abdomen is very, very similar to the leaf shape. The serrated edges, the way it sort of folds out and I'm going to touch this leaf here. If you look at the veins running down it, they're slightly whitish. So the abdomen of the flower mantis is sort of resembling that. And then if you look at a flower that's not opened, I'm just trying to find you a good example. Possibly this one here. Can you see that? Yeah. That's more like what the flower mantis is trying to replicate here, one of the closed buds. You do get pink and purple mantises, but this particular species is not trying to replicate the open flower on top. They're more trying to blend in with this. So if you just look at this section that I'm showing you right now, that's exactly what it's trying to replicate. I don't even know if I can find out where I found that. Where is the mantis dove? <laughs> okay. Well, that is a great sighting for the morning. I think we are overjoyed. I won. I won at the insect game. And we're really not far away from quarantine. So I think for the last little bit of the show, we may as well head up to quarantine. Or we can just stay in camp. But to be honest, this little pathway in camp, because the vegetation is so lush and it is so thick, you can actually find a lot here. I wonder if we could try and just stay on this road. Okay, Mantis, thank you. That was two. There are two here, which means I bet you we start to see them sprouting up everywhere now. Fiona, I'm actually not sure about that. And I don't entirely believe so because of their strategy. Now, they don't all look like flowers. You get mantises, we have tons in camp. Some of them actually look like sticks and it's not the stick insect. Some of them look like debris. Some of them just look like a normal insect. And then you get the huge ones that actually look like part of a tree. And their hunting strategy is to stay still and blend in with the background, be it a leaf, be it a flower, be it a piece of stick. And therefore, I don't think it would make sense or I don't think it would happen that they would hunt one another for that reason. But I guess the bigger ones absolutely could take down the smaller ones if they crossed paths. But I just think it's really unlikely that a flower mantis, for example, is going to cross paths with another species because it's sitting waiting. Just like a flower crab spider, I'm also looking for one of those. They sit and they wait and they ambush. So I think, yes, it's possible they are predators, they do prey on other insects, but would they come across one another? Definitely not the flower mantis, that's for sure. Sometimes you just have to spend long enough looking at the plant and things will pop out at you. Flower crab spider is now on my list that I've ticked off the flower mantis. But we'll try and find more mantis species for you. I mean, they are all incredible. I did an entire drive with one on my hat. Okay, I am literally not going to leave this area. I'm going to do my very best to try and find a flower crab spider. And I believe Mike is doing some birding.
We're still here at Nyati Pan, but uh, Lisa Moyhan is out and about still. Still there in that same clump of grass, just picking at vegetation. But what I'm actually looking for, I mean, as, as exciting as it is to see the Lisa Moyhan, I'm actually waiting for um, but these little uh, yellow washed birds that look like warblers but i wasn't able to identify them i'm hoping they come back i'm thinking it could be a willow warbler or an ictorine warbler uh, but uh, i need your help i need all of your help to do it because well, for a start i've never seen an ictorine warbler and secondly oh, they're over there bk but i mean Oh. Yeah, the, dead, the tall dead tree, the swallows are there, but they're just to the right of the swallows on the top of that dead tree. It's not going to be easy for the, the image as, as the color, for example. But So the first thing I thought with these birds, everyone, is I thought it's some sort of canary. However, canaries don't have that thin a bill. A canary's bill is thicker and stronger. Oh, man, it flew away. I just flew off. There's still one left, but it's not the colorful one. It's a female. And so then I thought to myself, it could be a warbler, because I know some of the warblers have a bit of a yellow wash. I thought flycatcher, but there's no yellow flycatchers that I know of. So I thought maybe a warbler. I thought ictorine or willow warbler. It has a bit of a supercilium, a pale supercilium, which is an eyebrow, like a pale eyebrow. But you can't really see it on the female as much. I told you I'm doing this hood spread 100k challenge. I'm like trying to find as many birds as I can within a 100 kilometer radius. And this is definitely a new bird for me that for this particular challenge. And I believe it's a warbler, but I just don't know which one. I mean, I might be wrong completely. It might not be a warbler at all. It's one of those little small birds that birders often just ignore. When they see it, they're like, oh no, it's very difficult to identify. Let me just pretend I don't see it. And that way I don't have to be embarrassed and I can't identify it, but uh, I've long since gotten over the embarrassment of not being able to identify stuff. It could be a super common bird and some of you might say, oh Mike, that's a, I don't know, whatever. I'll say, of course, jeez, why didn't I think of that? But anyway, you can't help me if you can't see the bird, so not much, uh, not much we can do about it until we see the bird again. In any case, those birds that are sitting up in the trees, though, those are mostly barn swallows. Oh, wait a minute. There's also some lesser striped swallows as well. Oh, and wire-tailed swallows as well on the left there. Let's see a few wire-tailed swallows. Wire-tailed swallows, barn swallows, and lesser striped swallows. It's, it's great, all the swallows are hanging around. They like the water holes because they can have a drink on these hot days. And so catch lots of the small insects which, which, which they feed on. I just need to mark down the wire-tailed swallow. Because that's, uh, that's another one. So I'm on 103 birds now, everyone. 103 birds identified in the last two and a half days. Thanks, Jazzy Girl. Yeah, I mean, it's so nice that the temperature's not so hot and the weather is lovely, a little bit of a cool breeze. So, of course, a lot of the birds and animals are very active. Let's hope it stays that way. Jazzy Girl, let's hope it sticks around. There's some blue wax spills coming down. That's nice. Got those already, though. I'm being a real twitcher at the moment. I'm ignoring all the birds that I've seen already because I just desperately want to know what that little yellow one was. But anyway, it's gone now. Hopefully it'll stick around and maybe this afternoon we'll come back and see if we can spot them again. I'll send you off to one of the other feeds. Hopefully Lauren's found her spider. Over the many years that Wild Earth has broadcast live from the African wilderness, we have met a large number of special individual animal characters. Wild Earth has created limited edition collections of non-fungible tokens for some of these unique animals. Not only will collectors be able to follow the lives of their animals on Wild Earth TV, 
but a portion of every sale from now and into the future goes back to the custodians of the wildlife habitat on which that individual animal lives as an incentive to conserve that habitat. These are conservation NFTs. Join us on this pioneering initiative Head over to our website to buy your tokens and get a 75% discount before the 7th of January 2022 when the pre-sale window closes. When on safari, there is nothing better than an evening spent under the stars chatting around a fire with the sounds of the wild all around you. If you sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer, you can build your own memories by joining our guides for regular fireside chats. Subscription payments can be made by PayPal, credit card, and now bank transfer. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. BirdLife South Africa, our country's only dedicated bird conservation organization. They have been very successful in a number of areas, including the conservation of more than 150,000 hectares of grasslands and estuary habitat, saving thousands of albatrosses in trawl and longline fishing, and training community bird guides as ambassadors for nature in rural areas. Celebrating their official 25th anniversary, they are sharing 25 of their top success stories across their social media platforms. BirdLife South Africa is currently striving towards the conservation of 132 bird species that are heading for extinction. If we conserve birds, we will protect other biodiversity and important habitats that provide clean water and clean air for humans. Their work is forever ongoing. People who love birds can become a member of BirdLife South Africa or make a donation towards a bird conservation project. got another treat for you for some reason I'm always able to get insects in my hand without them jumping at me I mean it's still cold but we have had some bursts of sun now this is of course the elegant grasshopper and really the name I mean it's perfect sometimes they're called rainbow locusts but the proper term is elegant grasshoppers. And I mean, look, look at this guy. And I don't want to give it a fright, but you can see six legs. <laughs> well, that didn't work, did it? Six legs naturally means insect, but in grasshoppers, those back legs are just incredibly strong and powerful. Now he's upside down. I'm just going to help him. Oh, come on, boy. Why are you upside down? Who wants to be upside down? Okay, and you can see that those back legs are completely out of proportion. They're ridiculously long, but that's exactly what makes a grasshopper a grasshopper because they're able to hop great distances really, really far, and that's their escape mechanism against predators. Are you waving? Hello. Saying hi to you all. <laughs> Yes, everybody's waving. And the muscles in that hind leg are really powerful, almost like a frog, if you like. It's the exact same as a frog, and there's a special sort of muscular contraction that happens very, very fast that allows them to just spring into the air, but they don't really have time or maybe the cognitive ability to plan exactly where they're going. So they see a threat, they know they need to get out of there, they contract that muscle, spring, it's like a springboard, release it, and they hop into the air, but they don't really plan where they're going to go. So sometimes they will end up in your face or possibly in vehicles or possibly in the jaws of death. Unbelievably beautiful and you can see the head the head is really clear you can see the eyes the antenna then you've got the middle part the thorax that you can see the folded down wings can you see the wings mm -hmm. they're flat they're very they're not too easy to see but he has got wings he can't fly they're just not great because he's better at hopping away and in that last part of the body that very fat part is the abdomen where the reproductive organs are the digestive system and that's the simple anatomy of an insect all insects have that anatomy. They're all just designed in different ways. 
So many of you are saying thank you. It was a tricky drive weather-wise, but we got there in the end. We're always out and about, and I got you. I think it's the first flower mantis of the season, or maybe the year at least, and we're ending on an elegant grasshopper. So let's hope that Wendy is fixed this afternoon and both Rowan and I can come out. That's what I'm really hoping for. But thank you everyone for jumping on board. It's always a pleasure to have you, no matter the weather. Please do join us this 